I remember we got to the point when neither of the kids really wanted to go away and they were parking up a bit and uh, particularly my son who was, you know, he was going to transition from primary school to high school and we were going to take him away to a country where we didn't speak the language and... Yeah, to Hungary. <laughs> it's like, it's not like, it's not like, he said, couldn't you go to the US? Uh, no. <laughs> like, no. G'day, I'm Rob Maliki. Welcome to Global Horizons. I'm coming to you today from Garrigal Land in Sydney. And my guest today needs no introduction for most of the industry, I would say, because she's an absolute pillar, a giant of Australian international education. My guest is Betty Lesk. Betty is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Studies in International Education. She's a professor emeritus for internationalization of higher education at La Trobe University. She's the chair of Koala. If you're not familiar with Koala, it's the Council on Australian Latin American Relations. I could go on and on and on. But Betty, let's just get to it because I'm dying for this conversation. Thanks for joining me on Global Horizons. Such a pleasure to be here and to be speaking to you from Ghana land. And I wanted to pay my respects to elders past and present. Absolutely. And just before we started our uh, hit record on this podcast, you were saying to me that when you were at school, no one in their wildest dreams would have imagined that you would have ended up in international education. And as someone who's been in international ed for 20 years, I just can't square that away with where you are now. So... Maybe if I could ask you, what what went wrong? <laughs> well, maybe it might be what went right. <laughs> it's true. It's very true. Yeah. I came from a, a working class background. My mother brought us up, three girls, pretty much on her own. She married, she remarried when she was, when I was 15 and I went to uh, a new school, very working class area, lots of poor families. We had no money to go on holiday. We, this is Adelaide. And... This was a group of kids at school who some of them were, most of them were never going to finish year 12. No one in my family had ever finished year 12 before before me. So first in family, as we call it here in Australia, to go to university. Didn't get my passport till I was in my 40s. So, you know, it's not even that as soon as I left school I got to the point where I was this is what I knew I wanted to do what I knew I wanted to do from the time I was five I think almost I would say from the time I was born was to teach I loved to learn and I loved to help other people to learn and I was asked to do that in various ways at school right from the right from primary school so I wanted to go into education and I think one of the things that went wrong in perhaps the the plan for me to leave school at 15 and become a shorthand typist and get married and have children and maybe marry someone who had a a professional job but probably not because that wasn't kind of what girls in that group of people did. What went right for me was that I was offered at the end of year 10 a teaching scholarship a bonded teaching scholarship it was the Whitlam years and I was able to get a scholarship to go to university at which my mother who was always very supportive of that was like hooray and my stepfather said well I don't know university is a wicked place you know there are some wicked people at university and he he didn't see what was the point in that education, especially for a girl. But my mother stuck up for me and off I went. I had teachers at the school as well who really encouraged me to do that and helped me through and and helped me into the university. And I somehow managed to get through university because I have to say the teaching was terrible. Most of it was terrible. It was a matter of survival and it was a matter of being determined to do what you wanted to do. So I was really focused on that goal. There were lots of things that happened in my personal life, again, that people would have thought, well, she's never going to get out of this. But teaching opened a lot of doors for me. What it did was it opened my mind and my heart to people and children 
from extremely different backgrounds. So because I was teaching in areas where there were many migrants, Indigenous people, refugees, and I was the person who got to teach, you know, the special group, the kids that no one else could manage because they didn't want to sit and listen. You know, then I think that kind of next thing that happened was that I connected with those those kids and those people and their parents and yeah, we took it from there. I spent 15 years in education and then moved into curriculum design and that kind of thing just fascinates me because I just love grids, you know, planning. and So I was born to do that, you know, and then, and then these other circumstances and things happened around that kind of capacity to want to direct the world and order the world and get other people to do things that I think they need to do. I've got so many side deals I can take and we, we haven't even gone to the gone to the last jump <laughs> into, uh, into into international ed but I'd love to take some of these side doors and then come back to that story. But first and foremost like are you proud? Do you feel proud of that journey? I mean what what, a, what an extraordinary story to have gone from you know a, a challenging background to Professor Emeritus you know at a, at a good Australian university you Deputy Vice Chancellor and Acting Vice, I mean, right to the top of the academic sphere. That's an extraordinary story. I do feel proud. I do feel proud. And I feel also very passionate about the fact that I want other people to have that opportunity. And I want that for them because I think the world would be a better place if everyone had the opportunity to be their very best selves. And I think I've had that opportunity to be my very best self. This is the very best me. I don't think I could have been anything any better. I'm happy with how I am. You know, I'm as happy as can be at the moment. So, yeah, but it would be great if other people could have that opportunity. And wouldn't the world be a better place if everyone felt that sense of fulfilment? Yes, the fulfilment. I think it's also, as you, as you say, just knowing that you've you've gotten to as high as you can go. And education, as we know, is like such a critical critical part of that. And one of the things you said, in, in, you know, as you're explaining some of your journey, you know, you're saying that teaching was terrible back at uni in those, you know, in the 70s. So obviously a lot has changed since then. It, what do you feel have been the big changes that hopefully has made our education teaching better than it, better than it was back then? Well, I think it's still probably very pat. Well, I know it's still very patchy and we know that from the data. I think the focus on data and I think some of the work that was done with the Australian Learning and Teaching Council they really focused on, again, on the quality of teaching and learning and that recognition that just because you are at the top of your field as an engineer or a, a physician doesn't mean that you're a good teacher and that good teaching is is not about telling it's about leadership it's about support it's about patience and giving people taking risks giving people the opportunity to explore themselves and what they want to do certain things for the way that universities operate i mean i think that it has changed and there is a lot, much much more understanding of the way that that students learn but I also think that in international education what got me into that was a sense of frustration with uh, what I was hearing and uh, seeing in assumptions around what international education was how you helped people to become or how you gave students the opportunity to become more intercultural international how you broadened their perspectives and if it's only up to travel, if it's only about mobility, mobility is important, absolutely. I mean, the thing that actually, that if we go back to that story, I guess the next big thing for me, apart from these op this opportunity to work with students from diverse backgrounds and learn so much from them, but also be challenged by managing a classroom where perhaps not everybody is wanting to learn from each other. They've got a whole lot of other things that are going on. The other big thing that happened was that actually we had a, a second child. We couldn't get childcare and so I needed a job that was more flexible. So I went into teaching English to international students because I could do that, you know, kind of with a university but also with private providers and it was short-term assignments. It was more flexible 
it worked around. It was it was good for me at that time. And then the university, as the as my daughter got older, and the and, oh, and interest rates went up to eighteen percent. I needed to go back to work full time fairly quickly. And they said, well, if you're going to get a full time job and a permanent job, you're going to need to get your masters. So I did a masters in applied linguistics, and I was supported by the university to do that. It was that additional support that came in behind me and that was largely because of institutional policies but also people who were pushing that. So, you know, people are very influential. I look at all of this and then I say, okay, so then I felt like, well, I'd done all of this work at home, if you like, (laughs) but I really hadn't, I'd never been overseas. I'd never actually been interstate, gosh, until I was well into my 20s. Adelaide was was my world. I had windows into this other world through these other people, through through other students. As I said, I wasn't didn't get my passport until I was in my 40s. And that was because I was working at this language centre. By then I had my master's. I just felt like I needed to get out. I was itching to get out. The first opportunity that came up was to manage a an IELTS preparation centre and my DP center in Budapest in Hungary. So I went over there for a year with the children. I wasn't going on my own. I wasn't, I didn't want to go on my own. The other thing about me as a child was I hated going away from home. Right? Well, I have to, I have to jump in that you hated going away from home. But in fact, like as you're telling your story, what I'm thinking is like, it, it's so amazing. You've ended up where, where you have, but at each of those kind of decision points, it feels like the safe option would have been like to go back to teaching. Or the safe option may have been to, to go back and do what you were doing be- before. But instead, you've got kind of taken a right-hand turn and, and sort of pushed on somewhere new, which is, to me, sort of, I'm thinking, she's a risk taker. You know, you're jumping out of the comfort zone in some way. And Mike, oh, where did that come from? Uh, no, there were, there is an element of risk taking. And I know that there have been other people in the same position who would never have done that. I remember we got to the point when... Neither of the kids really wanted to go away and they were arcing up a bit and uh, particularly my son who was, you know, he was going to transition from primary school to high school and we were going to take him away to a country where we didn't speak the language and... Yeah, to Hungary. (laughs) It's like, it's not not like, he said, couldn't you go to the US? Uh, No. (laughs) No. So, but we could have, and, and there were some issues with the contract and we could have backed out but I have the most incredible husband life partner he was like look we've committed to this we might as well just do it we'll it'll be a great experience so he was behind me all the way so I had this incredible support and that's not to say that it wasn't the the most challenging year of my life our lives all of us but we survived and we more than survived what were the biggest challenges well there was the challenge of just living in a country where English wasn't spoken very commonly. So there were times on the public transport, for example, where people would be quite abusive to you if you were speaking English with a Hungarian and they'd be abusive to the Hungarian person as well because they felt that there were a whole lot of people who were Hungarians who'd gone away when times were tough and now they were coming back when times were better and you were either one of those or, you know, you just didn't have a right to be there. You shouldn't be there. So there was that sense It was also just really difficult managing a business in a country that was still transitioning out of its former Soviet ways of life and doing business. So that was difficult. The business was financially in in trouble. So that was also difficult. And then there were a whole lot of people whose livelihood and whose very ability to stay in the country depended on the business surviving. And what about for the kids? What do you think your kids think reflecting back on that many years later? So they don't regret it at all. You know, we we talk about it often, as you know, that year. As we left, we cheered in the the airport once we got through immigration, like immigration, because we were going home, you know, and then we cried on the plane because they cried, as you know, because they were missing their friends and they would never see their friends again. So there's that. Joy and sorrow that goes with any kind of transition, I think. It was only a year, and that's what I kept telling myself and telling them, it's only a year. You know, like if we can get through, let's just get through this day and this week, it'll 
kind of unfold and it'll be better. So when I look back on it now, I think what it did for both of the children was absolutely opened their minds to travel to other ways of doing and they kind of understood that things weren't always the same as they are here for us now everywhere and that there were a lot of people who were much worse off. I mean, the the poverty in Hungary at that time was absolutely terrible to see. But then on the other side, the amazing culture and the amazing achievements of this tiny country, really, that has kind of shrunk over the years and the resilience of the people was something that I think they probably would never understand without having lived. So I reckon it's the most valuable time to do that with your kids, isn't it? It's like when when you see that shell crack open and the realisation that, oh my gosh, we are really lucky to have what we have and that people out there have got so much adversity that they face. Yeah, it's just like looking into a parallel universe for, for kids. So I think it's great to do that at that sort of formative age. We, we just went for our big trip around Australia during COVID and had to close our business down because, because of COVID and ended up going traveling for sort of 18 months. But sort of similar, similar sentiments, you know, ending up in these remote indigenous communities. This is Australia. These are our original indigenous First Nations people. And yet, I mean, I'd never even seen that firsthand to, you know, and, and my kids for them, it was just another world. And just the what what it does to you in terms of opening your I was going to say soul like, it, like you really just open up to that and realize how much more there is in this world that we don't understand. It's a powerful thing. Yeah, we're very lucky <laughs> to do what we do. So you're back from Hungary, and then what? So and then we get I get an invitation to move into another section of the a university, and that is the kind of the educational development center, but also international student resource support center so unisa established asked me to establish the international student service group but to combine that with educational development for staff on how to teach international students so it wasn't just to be it was to be a combination and so i i established that you know and got to work with an incredible group of people to build something new within an institution that had very strong leadership in Denise Bradley and a very strong commitment at that time to the development of seven graduate attributes. So we were one of the first universities in Australia to adopt graduate attributes and graduate qualities. They had six to start off with and then they added a seventh and the seventh was international perspectives. My job was to train all of the teachers in the institution to implement graduate quality number seven to ensure that all their students graduated with international perspectives and to run the international student services group alongside that, which was useful because they do fit together very well. I was going to say, how important do you think it was being able to speak that same language as the people that you're going in to try try to teach and, and make aware of this graduate att- attribute? Talking about the academics, for example, the fact that I had a master's, that I was also doing a PhD at the time, then that was that was important. However, when it came down to the crunch, they would always go to somebody in the same discipline area who'd done something in international and they would believe them or listen to them, assume they had more authority in the field than I did because they were of the discipline. I think what was important was that I understood that and I respected that and I was prepared to meet them where they wanted, you know, to find a meeting place, somewhere where we could have a conversation about what some common ground might be in relation to what they were already doing, what they would like to do, maybe felt they couldn't, and how a focus on international perspectives and intercultural learning might help them to achieve that goal. So it was about, it's, I think it's always about bringing people together and, and having a conversation about how you, can, how you can find some common ground and use that as a starting point to ha- do some work. That's going to benefit the students, first of all, and that's what academics are most concerned about, the students the professions, the institution, you know, and then if you can start to get them to think more broadly about society and and not just local or national, 
but also global how you can how you can help them to understand that everybody has is influenced by those external forces one of the things you you were talking about there was you know this really tough moment in leadership where you know there's there's a vision there's a direction that's been set uh uh, an organization is driving towards that vision, you know, more or less happily <laughs> on track for that to happen. But then suddenly something changes and you need to to change direction. Uh, and and you know, maybe an example of that right now in international education is th- this, this whole situation that's kind of popped up with visa processing being slowed down, international, inbound international is, is clearly being impacted significantly across the country. So there are hard decisions coming inside institutions right now is is there something that you've seen in your time in various organizations around how that changing of direction has been done well something that leaders can do either on small level or big level to help shift that direction or or, or make that less uncomfortable because it's it's a horrible uncomfortable feeling as we know i think it has to be a very bold and strong leader who's prepared to stand up and say, we have to change direction. We have to do it. We have to do some things very differently. This is not going to be easy. It's like ripping a Band-Aid off. Everything's not going to be the same for anybody. You know, probably everyone's life will, will have to change, but that is that is kind of life. And then prepared to stick to it. It's much easier to have that strong direction and have doubters even even amongst the the leadership group, than to be flip flopping around and not not bite the bullet, if you like. One of the disappointing things that I saw happen in in some instances was bringing in external consultants who know very little about international education, getting them to make suggestions about how you could improve it based on some sort of research that they've done, usually based on what's happening in another country and that might not be of any relevance at all to what's happening here. In fact, they might be following what we were doing but be 10 years behind. Some of the worst decision-making is when people don't recognise the expertise that they have within their own institution to make the changes, to even know what those changes might be. I think that's very sad. I think that just... That just can be quite destructive because then you lose a lot of very good people. So flipping that over, I guess the, the, the maybe the, the strong way to do that is by making sure you're asking people to design that change with you. Mm. Yes. Change is inevitable, right? Like we, yeah. we need to change. We, we need to change. And those who, yeah. uh, and like micro example, but with our business, we're running in you know, overseas study abroad provider out of Australia, heading overseas. We had to make the decision to close that in in a day we did we did did as many scenarios as we could on paper we saw that they were all terminal and we just had to do it and it was horrendous i mean it was such a painful thing to do but sometimes it's you you can only you can only play the cards you dealt so you got to play them as best you can so the next best thing i suppose is bringing people on that journey as best you can as well yeah and you imagine doing that with a much larger group yeah with thousands i mean yeah yeah Yeah. i just can't imagine the stress honestly at, at, at at that scale you know, you're running an organisation with thousands of staff members, tens of thousands of students. Mm. I think psychologically I'm probably not tough enough. I, I would I be tough enough to actually be able to shoulder the emotional burden of that, to be honest. I think like as in all jobs, I think you have to have a particular personality, a particular set of personal skills and abilities to weather that storm. But, you know, I've looked at people who've been able to do that and never would have predicted that they they would be able to do that so that's also something I think that people can learn on the job and in a way it's like you know like nobody would have imagined I'd be working in international education I've looked at some people and gone I never would have imagined you'd be in that position now but look at you you're doing a great job so well done you know well done you people are a constant source of surprise and that's a good thing you're a prolific author you contributed to so many different things and I mean built organizations, editor-in-chief of the, the JSIE, life member, IEA, I mean, contribution's enormous. Where does that desire to create, to build come from? What drives you in that regard? I think it's a love of learning and a love of 
facilitating learning. It's so full of so many surprises when you open up the door to people to, to, to do things that they never thought would be possible. To give them the opportunity, for example, to take on a role. I, you know, the, the, one of the first people I appointed into a leadership role in the international student and to just watch that trajectory of growth you know that's the greatest thing about about being an educator is facilitating learning not directing it but just giving people the opportunity and seeing where they go with it that is I think that I love writing I I love writing because writing helps me think and the you know I had to write all of my assignments by hand I think I typed my master's with my two my my six-month-old daughter on my lap like this but now to be able to cut and paste text and move ideas around and and have that lead to another way of thinking about something is just incredible so I love to write and that's why I write prolifically everything I write I start with one plan and it never ends up being what I thought by the end so for me that's a bit of a journey as well it's a bit like abstract art (laughs) I have a friend who's an abstract artist and she said you start by dabbling you know you start by doing this you you put some background paint and put something else down and you scratch a bit and you never quite know what it's going to come out like Betty so you know I've tried to paint alongside her and she goes "Mm, just you know just don't think about what you're trying to make and in a way I think that's the way I approach writing I'm both dabbing the things in there and trying not to think too much about what it is I'm creating it's it's one of those things that I think about a lot when I see my kids and the, the sort of technological world that they're walking into you know to me one of the most valuable things when you're young is just being bored sometimes so your mind wanders off and can create stories and you, know, you climb a tree and that becomes a tree house in your mind and and the same when you you know you write or you draw you just kind of like your mind is allowed to wander and it feels like this technology is just encroaching more and more on on that freedom and and I do worry about what that means for our ability to exercise our imaginations and to be creative did you have a feeling around that i mean as somebody who is creative and who who clearly loves that process of letting your mind flow its follow its natural process so i think stimulating the the imagination is one of the most difficult things when you're in a corporate environment as well because you want creativity and you want people to be able to imagine different things and that's you know the 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 research that i did on internationalizing the curriculum where you know, that was the next opportunity, going back to the story, the next opportunity after that that allowed me to work with with academic staff to internationalise the curriculum, but in a way that was research-based so that it was looking for what works for them. How can they use their imagination to, you know, how can they find new ways of thinking about not just internationalisation but their disciplinary knowledge and where it comes from and... How does that relate to Indigenous knowledges, for example? How does it relate to our history, to colonisation? You know, how is the curriculum? What are the other forces that have shaped the curriculum we've got now? And if we were to challenge some of those, imagine what that might look like. How? What does that entail? That's risk taking, and for some people, it's risk risk taking to even go there, which in a university should not be the case. You should be able to think freely about options and opportunities. Do, do you think that's um, changed? Do, do you think that it used to be more that way inside universities and that's that's something that's shifted? I don't think it's necessarily the university. I think it's actually within the disciplines to a sense, in a sense. You know, an academic's first loyalty is to the discipline community and university education is about bringing people into the culture of the discipline the norms the values the expectations the knowledge of course the ways of behaving acceptable versus unacceptable behavior that's all part of the disciplines it's hard to break out of that it's a double jeopardy especially if you're working in an institution where that's not encouraged or where it's got to the point where there's so much resting on the student fees that are coming in for what you know for that particular 
course or whatever, wherever those students come from, you know, I think it's it's a real risk that people will be too risk averse and in the end that has the opposite impact to what it should have. But if we go back to that visa point and the issue around international education as it is today, you know, I think we are at a point where we have to be thinking quite differently about what we do. The, the success on a commercial side has meant that governments have progressively stepped back from feeling any responsibility for their very significant role in funding and have maybe failed to keep pace with where it should have otherwise should have otherwise been so it's like that cycle isn't it it's you know the cycle drives the cycle <laughs> yeah well we have to be careful we don't lose our social license to operate within the Australian community if for example the continued influx of international students is seen rightly or wrongly as causing a housing crisis. Is that true or not? Is it partially true? Is it partially false? I mean, I think we have to look at all that and not not just, oh, we're not going to go there, you know. I think we have to understand that it is a social licence. So then mo- moving on, what then took you from UniSA to La Trobe? Tell me about that transition. Did you get a phone call? <laughs> Had a curiosity. And we no, can, we can I, end up with me, I, <laughs> I, came, I did the fellowship. I did the fellowship. I did move from the role in the educational development unit into the Dean Teaching and Learning in the Faculty of Business, Division of Business. And that was a five year contract. And four years into that contract, I got the fellowship with the ALTC and I asked to take leave for a year to do that and they said we'll see into your contract then we'd rather you kind of didn't so I took leave Uh, I went back to my substantive position and then when the fellowship ended there was no fellowship there was no dean's role to go back to because someone else was in that role and I was given the worst possible job for me which was an auditing job curriculum auditing job that I hated. And so I started to look around. I thought, this is up. Uh, nah, no. <laughs> this is, I'm desperately unhappy here. This is no. So I applied. I got interviewed on the same day for one at La Trobe and one at Curtin. I got offered them both and I took the one at La Trobe because Melbourne was <laughs> closer to Adelaide. <laughs> what advice would you have for people that are in that situation? I mean, given, you know, what, what, what I'm learning about you in this conversation, it makes complete sense to me that you know, you, you, you're suddenly in this in this role that you, you that doesn't fit, and you're like, I'm out. Fine, I'm finding something that that does fit. But yeah. what about for that person that that doesn't have that nat- natural inclination to to take the perceived risk of, of stepping out and doing something new? What what advice would you have for them in terms of perhaps getting through that 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 fear or that indecision? If you're not going to move, you've got to make yourself happy where you are. Otherwise, you you're just creating a situation of constant unhappiness and bitterness and that's horrible so you know you've either got to just stick it out or find your enjoyment in life outside of the workplace but I mean what I think we've all worked with people like that and I don't think that's a good a good thing so I guess I would find a mentor or someone who could help you through and that might be a colleague or a more senior person but I'd be looking for in most universities, there's someone that you can turn to that can give you a bit of advice on either how to survive in the job that you hate or um, how to get out and do something else. It's like that exquisite tension, isn't it, between you know being happy with what you've got and being completely uncompromising on settling when there may be better. I, I love this expression that, you know, the grass is always greener somewhere else. Yeah. Absolutely true. Yeah. But it's pretty freaking green right here. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And yeah. and I'm fascinated by this tension between being drawn to that, you know, infinitely smaller but possibly slightly better opportunity and settling for what we are, you yeah. know, where, 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 where we are right now. And the thing is, I think the further you get into your career too, it's like if, if you're lucky enough in your career to have some of those opportunities and you had enough experience, then, you know, you have more options. But... If you, if you haven't had those opportunities, it can be really difficult to sort of step out out yeah. beyond the uh, threshold. You know, you've been in international education now a long time and you've seen 
lots of different sides of it. You've seen the curriculum side. You've obviously seen the international office sort of side of things. In terms of the people that you've seen operating in international education over the you know, last few decades, does anyone really stand out to you, you know, current or former, that was sort of really special in some way? So I would say, I would say, without a doubt, Fuzzle Risby. Hmm. Tell me more. So he was the mentor for me on my Australian Learning and Teaching Council grant. He has the amazing capacity to, he's a very deep philosophical thinker, but he can connect with people in so many different ways and somehow bring them along on this intellectual journey. It's more than intellectual, though. It's a personal journey, I think. So somehow he manages to build that personal connection with people, even if it's a room of 100 people that he's talking to. And even if you wouldn't think the content would be is of a personal nature, it somehow sparks something off in their heads, in their hearts. And this is what I think is at the centre of international educators and international education, and that is getting to people's heads and hearts. And that's why I think in terms of internationalising the curriculum, it has to start at home and it can start at home and it can also finish at home. That doesn't mean there won't be some journeys, physical and you know, emotional and mental journeys along the way into other places and spaces. But, you know, if you, if you can't make help students to make the connections with people who are very different from them, whether that's their cultural background, their linguistic background, their how able-bodied they are, you know, if they can't see that the world is different for different people and therefore they think differently about the world and want different things and do different things, they don't understand that even on the most basic level. How can we ever have a world of where there's enough harmony for people to thrive in the way that we would want them to. But it's been wonderful chatting with you. Thank you so much for joining me on Global Horizons. Thanks, Rob. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to the Global Society, globalsociety.com.au. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.